Hello, I'm Africa 54 Managing Editor Vincent McCory in for Hashtag The Award. It's Monday, January the 2nd. This is Africa 54. The reign and unexpected retirement of the late Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI is discussed by VOA's Laurel Bowman. The row between Rwanda and DRC is threatening mountain gorillas, prompting stepped-up efforts to protect them, as Sananu Torrid reports. 2022 saw billionaire Elon Musk's back-and-forth Twitter takeover that opens questions about the social media platform's future. All this and much more on today's Africa 54. They lined up at St. Peter's Basilica Monday to pay their respects to Pope Benedict where he is lying in state. Some waited for hours before the doors were finally opened. He was the man that as a theologian gave us the chance to know God in a deep way and at the same time we could experience his closeness because he was both a great and humble person. Everybody could understand him. Benedict's body dressed in traditional red liturgical garments with a meter will lie instead until Wednesday. He was in his heart also, also a faithful follower of Christ and determined to stay faithful to his um, commitment as a, follow, a humble follower of Christ and to let that be the first driving force. But I would say that it was this, his, he was not afraid to face the questions of today. He was, he was very open in, in that regard. Lord, I love you, are reported to be the last words Benedict uttered shortly before his death, according to the Vatican News. For me, he was an innovator, mainly because he was the keeper of what the faith of the church has been for 2,000 years. In these regards, he was an innovator because he was able to safeguard what will never go away, which is the ground of our faith and our church life. Benedict, born Joseph Ratzinger, was 95 at the time of his death. The Vatican News website says that on Thursday, Pope Francis will become the first pope in modern history to preside as pope at the funeral of his predecessor. Now, Pope Emeritus Benedict served for just eight years before making history by stepping down in 2013, saying he, is, he didn't have this mental or physical strength to run the church. Uh, viewers, Laura Bowman has more. Pope Emeritus Benedict, who died Saturday at age 95, became Pope in 2005 to the delight of conservative Catholics. He was the first German Pope in 1,000 years and succeeded the widely popular Pope John Paul II, who ruled for 27 years, and he was followed by the current Pope Francis. During your papacy, you have shown great signs of humility and tenderness. Benedict made history when he stepped down in 2013 after ruling for just eight years, saying he didn't have the mental or physical strength to run the church. He went on to live in a convent on Vatican grounds. The Vatican announced his passing Saturday. With sorrow, we inform you that Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI passed away this morning at 934 in Monastery, Matter Ecclesiae in Vatican. The Pope Emeritus was beloved among conservative Catholics who tend to oppose modern trends such as divorce and gay lifestyles. The current Pope Francis is considered more liberal-minded. The Vatican says the former Pope's body will lie in state in St. Peter's Basilica beginning Monday. Pope Francis will celebrate Benedict's funeral mass in St. Peter's Square on Thursday. Laurel Bowman, VOA News, Washington. Following the death of Pope Emeritus Benedict, there have been reactions by Catholic faithful from across Africa. In Uganda, we hear from Aloysius Ivan Kalanzi, head of the Leti Kampala Archdiocese. The late Pope Benedict XVI 
I would say has been a devoted Christian, uh, guided the church through some time, and maybe at times with a number of challenges, but he steered ahead of the church, and has been a committed person as far as leadership is concerned. But when he saw that he was weak, he became the first people, the, the first pope in over 600 years to step aside and give way to a new pope. I think that was also very courageous. Uh, many leaders, many popes, even other leaders, they die in the seat or when they are still ha ha handling the old, having the mantle of leadership. So it was also a unique pope in that area. But also, he's a pope whom you normally say emeritus, who has taken a quiet life after his designation, and he has spent most of the time praying for the church and not interrupting the stewardship of the new pope, the current Pope Francis. You know, the, in leadership at times when you are there and you feel you are strong and have been leading, you feel maybe you know more than the others and all the time you want to interrupt, intervene, but he has kept a low profile and let the current leadership handle the mantle of leadership of the Catholic Church. So I think that was a, something great and which I can remember about him. To me, it meant somebody who can, like me, I'm a head of late, but it does mean that I have to be permanent. I think I picked a lesson from him that yes, you can leave the chair and others can steer on. And actually I'm following that because I'm having my first term and the elections are near, but I'm going to step aside and we'll get new blood. So I think that's what it means to me that yes, in leadership there are many leaders who can come along. And in Uganda here we have something where we have the same leaders for so long and I think they should take a leave from that late pop. Aloysius Ivan Kalans, the head of the Lady Kampala Kdaus's Uganda, speaking to reporter Francis Mukasa. Well, for more insight on Pope Benedict, I am joined live via Skype from New York by David Gibson. He is director of the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University. He is also the author of The Rule of Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI and his battle with the modern world. Mr. Gibson, thanks for joining us today. Good to be here, Vincent. Thanks. Now, first, uh, the Pope Benedict came, to, uh, came on after 24 years or so of uh, Pope John Paul. Uh, in terms of uh, his connecting with the world, uh, how did he connect with the uh, faithful in Africa, particularly? Well, uh, Pope Benedict XVI made an unexpectedly close connection with the people of Africa. Look, as you said, he came in after 26 years almost of uh, Pope John Paul II, the Polish Pope who made Africa a special focus of his pontificate. John Paul II traveled at least once a year to Africa and visited dozens of countries. Pope Benedict was a German cardinal, a theologian, very older and very uh, academic and scholarly. He was not expected to travel much or to connect with the African continent. But he did make two trips to Africa, visited three countries, Benin, Cameroon, and, um, and Angola. And he really, he, he made that connection, I think that personal connection. But there were three particular things, I think, that Benedict did that endeared him and made him an important figure to the continent. One is that he had a great focus on the environment. Benedict was actually known as the Green Pope for his advocacy on environmental issues and things that are really uh, so critical to the continent. He was also um, known as, uh, uh, he was also very outspoken on social justice issues and economic yeah. justice. He was known as a conservative, mm -hmm. but he was very outspoken, very liberal even in our context on that. And thirdly, he appointed a lot of Africans as cardinals and bishops and in critical positions in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Well, uh, having been the first one in now 600 years or more to step aside, uh, did he, in 
in some way actually uh, create a precedent for future popes, for the current pope, for instance? He did, absolutely. Benedict, again, known as a conservative, did one of the most innovative things in centuries by resigning. And he made way, again, he made way for Francis, a pope from Argentina, from Buenos Aires. Um, that was that has proved to be a prophetic move, shifting the the the, the image and, and balance of power in the church from Europe, which Benedict Joseph Ratzinger represented, to the southern hemisphere, Africa, Asia, Latin America, and what what the death of Benedict the Sixteenth really opens a door for is for Pope Francis to resign and retire at some point, which I fully expect him to do. Francis is 86 years old now, and he said he would like to retire, but he did not want to retire while Benedict was alive. Mm -hmm. The retirement of Pope Francis could open the door, perhaps, to an African pope. Well, uh, Mr. Gibson, thank you very much. Uh, David Gibson is director of the Center on Religion and Culture at Fordham University and the author of The Rule of Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI and his battle with the modern world. What are going to Eastern Africa? Tensions between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda are threatening the region's endangered mountain gorillas. Uh, despite the strain, communities living along both sides of the border are teaming up to improve gorilla conservation. Senanu Todd reports from Musanzi, Rwanda. Jospin Mwabunge is studying tourism and conservation at the International University of New Technologies in Goma, a city in the Democratic Republic of Congo on the Rwandan border. He has crossed over to the Musanzi district in Rwanda to learn more about community-based conservation from a non-governmental organization called the Red Rocks Initiative for Sustainable Development. He says his goal is to help local communities in the DRC benefit from conservation tourism. I'm learning here for to, to, just to try to copy the, the things how they are doing here and do uh, what they, they made here, uh, copy it in Congo in my country. The DRC and Rwanda together with Uganda share the Virunga Mountains a chain of eight volcanoes that are home to just over half of the world's remaining mountain gorillas. On the DRC side of the mountains, Virunga National Park has not been accessible for at least nine months due to activities of rebel groups in the region. According to the African Wildlife Foundation, the park's volcanic mountain ranges and endemic species placed it on the UNESCO's World Heritage List in 1979, but political insecurity Poaching and resource extraction have degraded the park to world heritage in danger status, where the park has remained since 1994. Recent activities of rebel groups in the region have further threatened the park and communities that depend on them. Um, the situation from Virunga it was no good, but we are not taking tourists there because of the situation. It's the war for now. Maybe when the peace will be coming again, then we will be trying to send the people there. To help, the Red Rocks Initiative in Rwanda is helping communities on both sides of the mountains to share skills in arts, crafts and community-based tourism activities. Having the national park being shared between the three countries, I always see it as an important thing because gorillas, they don't know the borders. So they move all around freely and then what we want to do, we want to make sure that what we have done here on the Rwandan side is also shared. He says the project targets vulnerable women and youth from both Rwanda and Congo by helping them create alternative income through sustainable projects and tourism initiatives. They don't know why do people go to see the mountain gorillas and pay that much money to go and see them. Because, and they are not, they wanted to get direct. So I always see that the more community-based organizations or products that you, in, you develop outside of any protected areas that can benefit the locals, it's going to be a part of the protection of the conservation. Staff says locals from both sides are taking part in the initiative. The women who come here, 
Sometimes they're very used to their normal ways of living, like growing crops and grazing animals. And sometimes some of them believe that's where it stops. But some of them, um, members of the community who came here at Red Rocks, they learned different skills, like something dealing with housekeeping, S some a lot of things in the in the hospitality management department. Bakazunu says, despite tensions, the initiative plans to extend to communities around the Vunga Mountains. Sana Anutot for VOA News, Musanze, Rwanda. Kenya's health ministry says sex education digital services launched to help rein in the country's teenage pregnancy problem have attracted more than 5,000 youth. Nena Nabinti, which means speak with a sister in Swahili, gives information and counseling on reproductive health by mobile application and a toll-free number to Kenyan teenagers who have the world's third highest rate of pregnancy. Victoria Munga reports from Nairobi, Kenya. Kenya's recent national data shows that one in five teenager girls is a mother by the age of 19. The country ranks third worldwide in teenage pregnancy. Aid groups are trying to help by providing sex education digitally. One mobile application called Nena Nabinti, which means speak with a sister in Swahili, provides teenagers extensive information on reproduction, health and direct interaction with professionals and counselors remotely. It also provides a phone number for app users. Janet Awino is among at least 5,000 young people using the platforms, especially for family planning education. I speak with a person that I cannot see, and that helps me be open. You can't speak with just anyone. Some people can't keep secrets. Virginia Mushira, a mother of one, says she could have benefited from the reproductive information such apps provide. My mom and dad were not the type to teach me about these things. We would meet at the table to eat and everyone goes their own way. They would talk about other things, but not about reproduction. They wouldn't tell me. A September 2022 study by Kenya's Ministry of Health found that a lack of information on reproductive health contributed to a surge in teenage pregnancies. Experts say many teens are afraid to speak with their family about sex and reproduction, and having access to such information can go a long way to remedy this. A lot of the clients who call, if they are adolescents 10 to 17, they want to know more about menstruation, have us call knowing, uh, what, uh, inquiring on uh, uh, safe days, others call wanting to know the effects of contraceptive. State authorities say they're training young people in communities to assist in programs that benefit young mothers. Some want to go back to school, so we take them back to school. Others say they cannot continue with school, so we give them skills. Some are also taught about employability and starting a business. Kenya's Ministry of Health adopted a 10-year national reproductive health policy in July that seeks, among other things, to address adolescents and young adults' reproductive health. Authorities hope that such initiatives as Nena Nabinti will boost efforts to control teenage pregnancies in the coming years. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. To the south of the continent now, Zambian President Hakainde Chilema has signed into law a measure that abolishes the death penalty. The move makes the southern African country the latest in Africa to end the punishment. Supporters of the government say abolishing the punitive measure was a key campaign promise Hichilema made as the main opposition leader ahead of the recent general election. To discuss the legality of the move, VOS Peter Kloto spoke via Skype with Zambian Justice Minister Mulambo Haimbe. Yes, yes, that's so very true. Um, so yes, uh, the decision is fully legal. Uh, perhaps I could explain uh, that uh, the constitutional provisions uh, in our Bill of Rights uh, uh, provide what I, I, I like to call a ceiling. Uh, the constitution says uh, everyone is guaranteed the right to life. Uh, then it provides an exception uh, uh, to the effect that where there is a decision of a court of competent jurisdiction that allows for execution to take place, uh, then an execution would take place pursuant to that. We had in our statute book uh, the death penalty for capital offenses. 
Uh, and, and what essentially we did was to say, let's take away uh, the, the possibility of a court pronouncing a death, death sentence for anybody uh, by repealing the provisions in the penal code and the criminal procedure code, uh, such that no court can then pronounce a death penalty going forward following the assent of the amendment bills that were put before the floor of the house. And so from the, with effect from 23rd December uh, 2022, when the president assented to the bills that were before the house, there is no longer in the statute book any uh, provision that allows for a court to pronounce a death sentence for capital offenses. The capital offenses were murder, treason, and aggravated robbery. The process that was taken uh, it required that uh, an amendment bill be put before the floor of the House in Parliament. It was fully debated, went through the three reading stages, because there are three reading stages under our provisions of the law. And Parliament approved the amendment bills with the consequence that it was only left for the president to assent to those bills. And that was done last Friday. We are very, very grateful uh, for that political will. And I said, as I said earlier, a very bold step uh, in the whole scheme of things. Well, that was VOA's Peter Clote speaking via Skype with the Zambian Justice Minister Mulambo Hambe. Now, still to come, the eventful year of Elon Musk and Twitter. Stay with us. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. Well, in other news, Malawi's health minister says the Southern African nation is delaying the opening of public schools in the two major cities of Blantyre and Lilongwe in an effort to try to slow down a surge in cholera deaths. Brazilians are bidding a final farewell this week to football giant Pele with Monday beginning a 24-hour public week at the stadium of his longtime team, Santos. The U.S. Trade Representative Office says the U.S. has dropped Burkina Faso from its AGOA trade preference program, citing deep concerns over the unconstitutional change in government in the West African country. Now, Elon Musk had an eventful year, capping 2022 with a $44 billion acquisition of Twitter in a takeover bid that almost didn't happen. The controversial CEO has brought changes and disruptions, layoffs and resignations that put Twitter's uh, fate into question. Viewers Tina Trin has more. New year, new beginnings. And for Elon Musk, new ideas for what Twitter will be in 2023. The tech billionaire rocked Silicon Valley when he took over Twitter in October. After mass layoffs, abrupt policy changes, and the reinstatement of controversial users, many are wondering what could possibly be next. What we see right now, I think, is a deep questioning of what is the mission and mandate of, of Twitter, this, this organization that has enabled public discourse in new and vital ways around the world. Uh, will that continue? In what form? So what, what is this brand here to do now? Musk says his Twitter is a home for free speech, but he suspended several accounts that use publicly available information to track the movements of his private jet. And several journalists who covered that story had their Twitter accounts suspended as well. Musk claims the accounts endanger his personal safety, but his platform continues to allow posts that threaten the safety of others with the Anti-Defamation League noting, quote, both an increase in anti-Semitic content on the platform and a decrease in the moderation of anti-Semitic posts. This less regulated version of Twitter may be harder to make profitable as more major advertisers stop spending on the site. The moment that Twitter is in from an advertiser perspective is that there is tremendous risk involved with making a decision to continue to advertise there. With ad sales faltering, Twitter will have to find new ways to make money. If you want to have an open platform that's not moderated or lightly moderated, you're going to have to find a new revenue stream, say, charging users or finding other ways to create value for users that you can monetize, say, through financial payments. But it's going to have to rely on payment from the users, not payment from the advertisers. But how many users remain? In July, Twitter reported 237 million monetizable daily active users, 80% of whom were outside the United States. 
Globally, Twitter ranks 15th in popularity among social media outlets, with 436 million monthly active users, compared to Facebook's 2.9 billion, according to market research firm Statista. Some analysts say Musk's changes are the jumpstart Twitter needs. This is a company that has been slow in growing new users and slow in developing new revenue streams and slow on pursuing new markets for the future. If it had continued on that path, it's almost certain that uh, the business would be in perpetual decline. But can Musk replicate his success at other enterprises? What we're seeing in terms of Musk and how he manages and owns Twitter is not inconsistent with how he manages SpaceX and Tesla and his other businesses in that he has a very aggressive risk-taking management style. It definitely puts a lot of pressure on people and it, there's a certain kind of person who can handle working at that company. But it's clear that at his prior companies, Musk has accomplished a lot of amazing things that weren't thought possible. And we'll have to see if that's going to transpire at Twitter. Musk enters the new year continuing to cut costs, with the New York Times reporting that Twitter has stopped paying office rents and is considering cutting severances for laid off workers. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. Well, and that's it. Have a good night. reiterate our call for a cessation of violence in northwest Syria. It is incumbent on all sides to agree to and implement a comprehensive nationwide ceasefire that protects civilians from violence. The United States urges an immediate de-escalation in northern Syria. has delivered on our commitment to fund early recovery activities, including through contributions to the UN pooled fund. Over 2.4 million Syrians have directly benefited from this work. The people of Syria who have endured far too much pain and violence deserve better. We have a responsibility to do everything in our power to push progress forward and to build a more just, peaceful, and secure future for the Syrian people.